Hi, welcome to the next edition of The Pet Factor. I'm Dr. Jim Hosek. I'm Brittany. And we're here to talk about your pet's wellness. And this week we're going to talk about a condition that affects a lot of dogs, Cushing's disease. Mm -hmm. um, it's also known as hyperadrenocorticism, which sounds kind of fancy, <laughs> but hyper just means overactive, and adrenocorticism refers to the adrenal gland function. So it means the adrenal gland is just functioning way too um, actively than it should. And this, like the hypothyroidism, this is sort of a slow progressive disease. So something that shows up over time will oftentimes spot the first signs of it on our exams or during blood tests. Mm -hmm. The adrenal glands are two little glands that are actually lo located right next to the kidneys. So adrenal means near the kidney. Mm -hmm. And they actually look like little tiny kidneys. Mm. They have a medulla and a cortex, so an inner part and an outer part that have different functions. But when they start producing too much, that's when the... Cushing's disease kicks in. It's very rare in cats, but it does happen. Mostly we're going to see this in dogs. Okay. Uh, ferrets have a form of it where the adrenal glands actually produce too much of the sex hormones. Uh, that's one of the hormones that they do produce. They actually produce three types of hormones. Uh, the glucocorticoids are the main one, that's the cortisol. Mm -hmm. We'll also see mineralocorticoids, which uh, affect the sodium potassium levels. And then the uh, sex hormones. You can have testosterone and progesterone and estrogen produced there. Mm -hmm. Not as much levels as the sex organs, but uh, they are produced there as well. Mm -hmm. In dogs, it's typically dogs older than six years of age, slightly more females than males. Cats, usually it's going to be old, much older, about 10 and a half, 11 years of age, no sex predilection. And when we see the syndrome in ferrets, usually they're going to be at least three or four years old before it starts to show up. There's two forms that we see in the, in the animals, the pituitary dependent, or PDH, and this is the primary form that we see about 80 to 85% of the animals. Okay. It's usually found in smaller breeds, but all breeds can be affected. Mm -hmm. Beagles, boxers, dachshunds are the big small breeds. We see it in German shepherds, yeah. um, poodles, and terriers. Um, I think the poodles are the ones I see a lot of. Yeah. Adrenal tumors are the next form, and they're about 15 to 20%. About half of those are benign, half are malignant. Again, this is going to affect more of the medium to large breeds, but also some of the smaller dogs too. So we'll see this in the, the dachshunds and the German shepherds, Labrador retrievers, yeah. uh, poodles and terriers. And uh, Cushing disease can actually, we can actually cause Cushing disease by giving too much cortisol medication. Hmm. So prednisone or things like that when we're treating allergies or um, trying to suppress the immune system for other reasons, we can actually induce this condition in dogs. Mm. So that's one of the things I always ask <laughs> when we see this as a, are they on any medications? Yeah. It's oftentimes associated with other problems, including urinary tract infections and bladder stones, high blood pressure, okay. diabetes, and we talked about that when we talked about that, diabetes. Yeah. Sudden acquired retinal degeneration, which are changes in the eyes that can occur uh, related to that. Hmm. Uh, renal function problems, so the glomeruli, which are the filtering units of the kidneys, can be affected by this. Okay. Pancreatitis, and we talked about that in the pancreatitis uh, podcast, so if you've uh, missed that, make sure that you uh, go back and listen about that. Uh, we do know steroids can actually make uh, pancreatitis sometimes worse. Sometimes we use it for treating chronic pancreatitis at lower levels. And then the last thing would be neurologic symptoms that can develop, and blood clots can be a consequence of Cushing's disease as well. So you can get uh, emboli that can go to the lungs and other parts of the body. When we see these dogs come in, it's usually going to be one of these dogs that's drinking a lot of water. Mm -hmm. And they can also have a thin hair coat, very much like yes. the hypothyroid dogs. So we're looking for changes in their eating and drinking. They can sometimes have an increased appetite. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they got a pot belly appearance, a pendulous abdomen. Yeah. And then a lot of times with the hair cold, don't we see like a rat tail starting up yeah, too? that can happen so as well. So like usually dogs just with like nice full tails, yeah, they turn really nasty. Then. Right. And it's, it's just, it's sometimes just the thinning of the hair. Mm -hmm. It's usually more generalized than the, sometimes with the hypothyroidism, it can be more localized, but it's usually symmetrical. They are also more prone to skin infections, and they're prone to a condition called calcinosis cutis, which is actual calcification of the skin. So you look at calcium lesions oh. because of the cortisone, and that's very typical. And despite being overweight, they'll a lot of times have muscle atrophy. So they'll put a lot of fat on, but they'll lose muscle tissue. Retinal hemorrhage, so the changes in the eyes are, are very common. The elevated blood pressure when we screen them, and we've seen this, that, that'll be a, a good symptom. And in cats, we'll also see their skin getting very fragile and tears very easily. Oh. So you might be clipping a mat out, and then, oh my gosh, I just cut this cat. Mm. It's not because you were bad with the clippers. It's probably because they have some underlying problem. 
So when the pituitary uh, tumors occur, this usually is a, is a problem, the a benign tumor in the pituitary gland where they're producing too much of this ACTH hormone. They can also develop a condition where the pituitary gland just is not receptive to feedback mechanisms. So the body has this feedback mechanism when they're produced too much cortisol that tells the pituitary to shut it down. In the case of these animals that have this uh, condition, they, their pituitary doesn't know to shut it down and keeps sending out the signal to produce more and more cortisol. Okay. The adrenal tumors are usually 50% benign, 50% malignant, mm -hmm. and usually only one adrenal gland is going to be affected. So one of the ways we can help distinguish between the two forms is in pituitary dependent, both adrenal glands are probably going to be enlarged yeah. in the adrenal form, just one. Mm. On our diagnosis and our lab tests, we're going to look at a blood count. Uh, we're looking at what's called a stress leukogram, and that's just a fancy way of saying um, too much cortisol can affect the types of white blood cells that are present. So we're going to see an increase in the neutrophils, which are the pus-forming cells, mm. and a decrease in the lymphocytes, which produce antibodies, and the eosinophils, which help fight parasites. So when we see increased neutrophils, decreased lymphocytes, and eosinophils on our blood count, that's what we call the stress leukogram, and that's common. Cushing's disease. Okay. We also, in the blood chemistries, will see the elevated alkaline phosphatase, and that's the most common thing. We'll see it, normal alkaline phosphatase, about 150. We'll see these dogs 500, 1,000, mm -hmm. 3,000. And then when we put together with the clinical symptoms, that's usually pretty diagnostic right there. We'll also see increases in cholesterol and mild elevations in the glucose. Not terribly high. It's not going to be in the 200s like we'd see with diabetics, yeah. but it might be 180, somewhere around there. It's not unusual for their urine to be dilute because they're drinking lots of water. But then they also have elevated urine protein, and that can be because of the damage to the kidneys from the glomerular uh, disease. If we do x-rays, um, it's not unusual for their liver to be enlarged. Hmm. Bladder stones are another problem that we can see associated with this, so we might see bladder stones. And in some cases, you can actually see the adrenal glands because they start to become mineralized. Hmm. So you might see little white dots right in front of the kidneys, and that gives you an idea that that's what you're dealing with. Hmm. So those give us a preliminary idea whether that the adrenal glands are not functioning well. So then we have to do an adrenal function test. And there's several that we'll do with this, depending on what the doctor's comfortable with, what their clinical symptoms are, how important it is we distinguish between the two types. The most common one that we'll do is what's called an ACTH stimulation test. That's the adrenal corticotropic hormone, the ACTH, that we give the dogs mm -hmm. um, after we take a blood sample, and then we measure their cortisol levels an hour or two later. Mm -hmm. Depends on the lab. Some labs like an hour. Or I think our lab likes an hour, some like yeah. two hours. And so what we're looking for is is the cortisol level starting out high and then are they stimulating even higher? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can tell the difference between adrenal um, form and the pituitary form by how much it's stimulated, but not always. In the other testing that we'll do, there's one called the dexamethasone suppression test. We typically use what's called a low-dose dexamethasone suppression test. And this does help us distinguish a little bit more between the two types. In this test, what we're doing is seeing how well the adrenal glands suppress when we give them cortisone. So normally when you give cortisone, the adrenal, the natural cortisol levels will fall. So we're giving a form called dexamethasone that's not going to interfere with the test. Mm -hmm. So we check their cortisol levels, we give them a little shot, and it's a very small amount, 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram, which is much lower than we do for treating any other diseases. Mm -hmm. And if we see that those levels then de depress below normal or below 1.4 milligrams per deciliter on the blood test, then we've got our diagnosis of Cushing's disease. When we're doing these tests, we're actually going to be doing three samples for that test. So we're doing one right before we give the dexamethasone, and then one four hours and one eight hours afterwards. Yeah. And whether or how those four and eight hours uh, tests are affected can also help us distinguish between pituitary and adrenal forms. Not always, but you can see some changes that are, are uh, consistent with the pituitary form there. It doesn't always work. So we will sometimes do a high-dose dexamethasone suppression test. That's where we give them even a 10 times higher dose of the dexamethasone. And in that case, most of the pituitary type will suppress, um, but not all the adrenal ones will suppress at the, the eight hour. So we look at that as a way to distinguish them. There's actually an oral dexamethasone test that you can do, <laughs> and it uses a, uh, a variation of the urine cortisol creatinine ratio. Now that's a sort of a screening test that we can do. It doesn't involve them having to come in for time tests. We just make sure we get the, the morning urine from the dog. 
and we look at the cortisol levels and the creatinine levels, we take the ratio of those. When we're doing the oral dexamethasone suppression test, we'll actually get a, a normal urine cortisol creatinine ratio for a couple of days, and then we have the owners empty the dog's bladder a few hours before we need to get the last sample, usually at like a noon and a two o'clock, and then about eight hours after they get the morning sample, we get another sample after they've had the dexamethasone and then mm. measure that ratio. We don't use that that often, but some places do, and it is really helpful for dogs that aren't very good at having their blood taken. Taking blood can stress the dog and stimulate yeah. the adrenal gland, so that can interfere with the testing, so you may not get a very good test that way. There's some other things where they can measure the endogenous ACTH levels, which are not very effective, very expensive. We don't bother with those. The other diagnostic test we can do is imaging. So we can actually have the ultrasound people come in and look at the adrenal glands. Hmm. And they can actually measure the difference in size and the enlargement of the adrenal glands due to the disease. And they can tell you which ones, if there's um, only one's affected, then that helps distinguish between the adrenal and pituitary. Hmm. If they're both affected, it's probably the pituitary. When you're looking at which one's affected, is it like one a right one versus a left one, or is it just it, one's affected, so that's the test? Right, uh, and it's... It can be either the right or the left. Okay. But usually in the adrenal form, only one will be effective. Okay. And that's probably the most common way they diagnose it in ferrets because the ferret form only produces the sex hormones, which are a little bit harder to check on the blood test. So those are where you're going. And that's helpful if you're going to end up doing surgery to remove the adrenal tumors because, like I said, half of them are malignant. So sometimes mm. it's worth doing that. They can also pick these up on a CT scan or an MRI. So if your veterinarian is going to recommend imaging, especially if they're suspicious there's an adrenal tumor, that would be a good way to tell which one's affected so when the surgeon goes in, they know where to go. Yeah. Treatment um, is basically trying to suppress the cortisol uh, production in the adrenal glands. What we're trying to do is get that down to normal. And it's a lifelong treatment. It's ongoing. There's a bunch of drugs that have been used to, to treat this. When I first started, we used mitotane a lot. Um, we're using more of the veteral, uh, which is the more common one. Trilostane is the, uh, the generic name of that. And then um, we've also in the past used ketoconazole, which is an antifungal okay. drug, but actually does suppress adrenal function. Mm. Has a lot more side effects um, than the other medications, but in some animals that can be a less expensive way of treating it than some of yeah. these other things. So if they can't afford the veteral or they can't afford the mitotain, then that might be a way of going. The protocols differ, differ depending on the drug, so sometimes there is an induction phase where we'll try and get that, those levels down and then taper it down. But with all of them, it does involve monitoring the adrenal gland function, usually with the ACTH test. We want to make sure we don't suppress those adrenal glands too much and cause the reverse condition or the hypoadrenal cortism or Addison's. And if that happens, then they can go into an Addisonian crisis and they can yeah. get really sick. So it's not unusual for us to have the owners have some prednisone on hand at home, especially when we're doing this induction phase, so that if they do start showing these symptoms, vomiting, diarrhea, weakness, shaking, they just give a dose of that and they'll help correct it. So all these medications, though, they are going to be lifelong, like even yeah. the ketoconazole? That right. Would be like, hmm. And typically, these animals survive, on average, about two years. Okay. So it's... It can eventually wear out on them, especially if it goes untreated, it can be less. And some people choose not to treat. They figure it's, it's okay. I got a dog that drinks a lot of water, their hair coats thin. They're probably going to live a year, maybe a little bit longer. Yeah. But if they can live with it, then they, they do okay. If it, does, if it does go untreated, it will progress, and then you're going to start seeing the skin changes, and the high blood pressure is probably the biggest thing I think that is going to cause problems for those animals going mm -hmm. forward. So again, this is one of these hormonal things. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them, but like the hypothyroidism is going to affect their hair coat and make them drink a lot of water. Yeah. So if you've got a pet who's drinking a lot of water, their hair coat maybe only looks dull in cats that might be a little ratty yeah. um, or it's thinning, and you can see their skin, this is be a good way to get them screened. So typically we'll do the uh, blood count and the blood chemistry first, and if we see evidence of it, we'll go ahead and do the adrenal function testing. Yep. And it may require several rounds of testing to get to the definitive diagnosis, but it's really important to help uh, differentiate it from other forms of that. Yeah. And like we mentioned with the hypothyroidism, it's not unusual for a dog to have Cushing's and hypothyroidism at the same time. So sometimes we end up diagnosing two problems and mm -hmm. having to treat them. All right, let's move on to the pet health news section. And this week, uh, we got some interesting stories. This was kind of neat. I just came across this when I was <laughs> doing my research for the show. So this was a dog that was adopted from a no-kill shelter down in Florida. Okay. And so as part of their adoption, they knew the dog had bad teeth. They sent it to, to a veterinarian to get his teeth cleaned. So their 
getting the dog down, they get it down, and they look inside its mouth, and wedged between its upper teeth is a stick. Oh. And the stick had actually started to deteriorate the roof of the mouth and cause bad infections around the teeth on either side of it. Oh. So it had probably been there for years. Oh. And the dog was still able to eat. It's still eating. Was still doing fine with it. Oh. But they ended up having to take out the two teeth and we were able to get the stick out and then the mouth healed up very well once that was that's done. Oh. I remember having a dog that had a bone stuck between his teeth up there, a little rib bone. Wow. From, you know, from, from little baby back ribs. <laughs> and it, the, they noticed that it was a problem because the dog couldn't close his mouth all the way. Yeah. <laughs> but just imagine like having a stray dog just still eating though. Mm-hmm. Like usually if something gets stuck in there, they stop eating or things. That's... Well, the dog was going strong. It probably had been there. It maybe bothered him initially, but then it pushed it up so far in his mouth that it didn't be a problem. And then once the, the tissue around there died, it wasn't that painful for And then like, him. it didn't cause any issues with the eye or anything? That's no, crazy. No, just wedged between there. So, wow. So that dog's off to his nice family. He's going to be doing <laughs> fine. Oh, good for him. The next story is kind of a neat one regarding those crazy cats that will attack you out of nowhere. And mm-hmm. we've all heard of these. People say, oh, I'm walking down the hallway, my cat just comes out and bites at my ankles. Or I'm petting my cat and they go after me. Well, behavior specialist John Sirabasi um, has uh, shared a bunch of reasons why this occurs at a recent uh, symposium and ways you can help deal with it. Mm-hmm. So he breaks it down into five major types of aggression. There's redirected aggression, and this occurs when a cat can't get at a stimulus, so it goes after another family member. Okay. So it might see a cat outside and then starts to attack you because it can't get to that cat. Yeah. And the aggression flips on like a light switch. Um, and the remedy is just basically try and separate that cat from the target, okay. close the window blinds, don't let them look outside, and reduce the new stimulus. So if you have a cat that likes to look out the window and then they get aggressive when they see other animals, just the simplest thing is to avoid it. It's really, yeah. it sounds easy, but you, you know cats like to look outside mm-hmm. and stuff, but if they're going to get really stressed out, then you're not going to worry about it. Yeah. If you can keep other animals out of the yard, that's another mm-hmm. way you can yeah. deal with it. They also have territorial aggression. But cats' territories are not like, oh, this is my room, or this is my house, or this is my yard. It's a space around them. They carry their territory with them. Okay. So when they get too many other animals in their space, that's when they'll get aggressive. And this is most commonly seen when we have people merging their household pets. So you get people that are uh, yeah. getting married, they bring their cats together, and then all of a sudden they start fighting. And these cats were never aggressive at all Before, on their own. Yeah. But it's usually one cat that's going to be the instigator. <laughs> so the, the solution for that is what they call the um, having enough house. So you want a house of plenty, so you have enough space for the cats, Mm -hmm. enough space with litter boxes and food and everything else and just keep them separated. Mm -hmm. You may not solve the problem, but you can avoid it just by letting them have their own space. Yeah. There's fear-related aggression, and this uh, stops when the fearful stimulus disappears. It can get worse um, when classic conditioning causes the um, aggressor to start associating the fear with the victim all the time and every time. Mm -hmm. So if they're scared of something and you're always there, then they might start to associate that with you. Like a cat with their medication or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or a sound that might scare them. Mm-hmm. Um, a furnace kicking on, a dryer going into yeah. uh, kicking on, a washing machine going into spin cycle. Those type of things yeah. that occur spontaneously but scare the heck out of the cat. This is one of my favorites because I see this a lot, the petting-associated aggression. Yep. So the cat comes, sits on your lap, you're petting it, you're petting it, and then all of a sudden he turns around and starts snapping at you. Yep. You go, what the heck? <laughs> you came up here, you wanted to be petted, and now you're biting me. I don't want to pet you when you do that. Yep. And this is something that he says is basically due to the fact that they're getting two things that they like. They're getting petted and they get to bite somebody. Oh. Really weird. So the key here is to try and recognize when... The petting is too much for the cat. Start. And stopping before you get to that point. So it, and then the cat, if he, if he wants to stay on your lap, he will. If he doesn't, but say, say you know, boy, I can pet him for like 30 seconds and then they get aggressive. Just pet him for 30 seconds. Huh. So again, it's one of those things, you know, how do I stop him from doing this? Well, just don't do what causes them to, have to do it. Huh. I wonder if I can use that as a thing for me. Hi, how are you, bite? <laughs> <laughs> and I keep people away for a little while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If they start petting you, then yeah. I can see that happening. <laughs> Then there's the play-related aggression, and this happens when a new kitten shows up in the house and the older cat goes after them, and they're they're just not interested in playing with them. Um, This has nothing to do uh, with the younger cat. 
it's just it need to give it other outlets for its play. So mm -hmm. play with it with the, the string on the a feather on the string and the things like that. Mm -hmm. and let the older cat just kind of have his space and do his thing. Well, and then that makes sense. I don't think people really understand, you know, age differences for animals. That's like if you take a newborn child and say, go play with my 87-year-old grandfather or something. Yeah, they're going to play for five minutes, but then when granddad's tired and the baby keeps wanting yeah. to play, it, it's going to get a little aggravated. You know, these arthritic right. and everything, so you got to have an outlet. And I do I do seem to see that as the kittens get older, the older cat does become more tolerant yeah. of them. Uh, I think it's easier sometimes bringing a younger cat in with an older cat. I just think sometimes they're able to maybe even, with their aggression, get that cat in its place and then yeah. they, they get lined up. But what they found is that the... Uh, when you're introducing a new cat to your household, it doesn't really matter whether you do it quick or slow. Oh. It does not change their aggressive behavior. Okay. So it's really based on the cat's personalities, especially the cat that was there first. Yeah. So he's going to be the one that determines whether or not things are going on. Hmm. And there's some cats that will not live together peaceably. Yeah. So they have these uh, tools here to help you adapt with those cats called the feline aggression toolbox so <laughs> counter conditioning that's where you offer a negative stimulus by inter introducing or uh, offset a negative stimulus by introducing a competing pleasurable stimulus okay so like. if they're starting to go after you when they get excited play with them do okay. something like that or scratch their head or something but we want to just basically if they're seeing something that upsets them distract them with something else that's really pleasurable for them. Yeah, usually put down like a treat or food or something, mm -hmm. especially if they're really food right. motivated. Desensitization, and that might be with the fear-related ones. So mm -hmm. kind of mildly expose them to the triggers uh, below the level that stimulates them and keep doing that more and more until eventually the threshold goes up and they're not affected by it as much. We talked about the house of plenty. Plenty of food, water, litter boxes, and other resources for the cat, toys, places for them to hide, having a cat trees in different spots so mm -hmm. they don't have to try and share a cat yep. tree, which can mend <laughs> poorly in some cases. And then proper play activity, especially supervised for cats struggling with issues. So making mm -hmm. sure if the cat's having some aggression towards a person, they're playing with them, but make sure you're there to watch so you mm -hmm. can uh, do this if they're uh, having aggression towards other animals. If they're getting some play time, that's going to be a lot less likely because now they have another outlet for that activity. Mm -hmm. And then the last case is medications. Uh, axiolytics, um, SSRIs that they use in people. Uh, we've got a cat here in the clinic that's on yeah. <laughs> the fluoxetine. <laughs> so those can help reduce the stress for the cat. Yeah. So we talked about stress last time in dogs. That's going to be very important. And he doesn't like punishing the cats directly. He recommends doing remote punishment. Mm -hmm. okay. So that might be even using a squirt bottle where you can be really far away or okay. a squirt gun. Yeah. Or having some of these, they have these automatic things that you can put on your yeah. counters that yeah. spray them when the cats get up there. Those are really good for yeah. getting those things. Yeah, my cat knows when the squirt bottles come. Sometimes when I don't want him on places, I'll just put the squirt bottle there and he'll like avoid that area like the plague <laughs> because he knows what's going to happen. There you go. <laughs> now we're going to move on to a year end topic here. Yeah. This is the top 10 dog and cat names of 2019. Mm -hmm. Now these were assembled by. Um, a couple of pet insurance companies, Nationwide Pet Insurance and Trupanion, and they surveyed their customers and searched through their databases of all the new pets that were signed up, mm -hmm. and this is what they came up with. Okay. And we're going to go through these lists one at a time, but you're going to find some similarities as we get towards <laughs> the, them here. So for the dogs, let's start with number 10. <laughs> we have Oliver. Oliver. Number 9 is Bear. Number 8 is Daisy. 7 is Max. 6 is Cooper. 5 is Lucy. 4 is Bailey. Three is Charlie. Two is Bella. And number one, Luna. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you notice there's a lot of people names in there. Yeah. <laughs> we got some Charlie's, Bailey's, Lucy's. So people do consider their pets their kids. So they're giving those. The only really non-person name is Bear. I'll say, yeah, I think every name on this is a person <laughs> besides Bear. And I'm pretty sure there's a guy out there named Bear somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> now we're going to go to the cat names. So let's see if anybody's got these cat names. It's coming in at number 10 is Gracie. Number nine is Leo. Number eight is Sophie. Number seven is Lily. Number six is Cleo. Great cat name. <laughs> Number five is Max. Number four is Oliver. Number three is Daisy. Number two, you might recognize this, Bella. And number one, hmm, what could it be? Luna. Again. <laughs> Again. The top cat and dog names are the same, Luna, Luna. and Bella. <laughs> This is crazy. And there's a couple other names that show up on both lists. I think uh, um, 
Oliver's on both? No. Yeah, Oliver's, Oliver's on both. Oliver's on both. Max is on both. Yeah. So, come on, be a little bit more creative with your pet <laughs> names here. Hey, I think I'm pretty creative. My dog is Boss Baby in Beast Mode. <laughs> like, you find anybody else with those names, and okay, uh, we're we've fine. Got, we've got a Sanyaya and a Hedwig. <laughs> So they think the reason why these were very popular is because of the Twilight and Harry Potter movies. Ah, uh, okay. Because in Twilight you had Bella, um, and then in Harry Potter you had uh, uh, Harry Potter was uh, was Bella, right? Oh no, Bella was from Twilight, Twilight, and Luna Lovegood is popular in Harry yeah. Potter. Yeah. Yeah. See, that shows you how much I watched those movies. <laughs> and then, um, so. If you have any of those names, it's just kind of neat. We'll see if they come out with this list next year and go over that with you. But let's be a little bit more creative here. Let's get some different names for the dogs and cats. Yep. Okay, now it's uh, time for Case of the Week. And this week, um, I'm going to talk about a dog that came in today and actually I diagnosed this dog about six weeks ago with heartworm disease. Okay. And the heartworm protocols have changed in the last 30 years since I've been doing them. And most recently, we've discovered that antibiotics can be a really valuable part of the treatment. So uh, Webster, we started on doxycycline six weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And he was supposed to then come back two months later for a follow-up visit. The receptionist kind of got that mixed up and scheduled him for six weeks. So we had to send him back. But the reason why this 60-day uh, wait time is important is that that antibiotic kills this type of bacteria that helps the heartworm survive. Okay. And once you kill those bacteria, those heartworms start to wither over the next 30 days after that. So you have to wait that full 60 days before you go into the treatment. So Webster's doing very well. He's responding well to that part of the treatment. He tolerated the antibiotics very well. He, she said he got a little sick the last four or five days, but I told her it probably wasn't the antibiotics it was the last four or five days. And he had vomited up a little pieces of his toy, so I think that's uh -huh. what that's from. Yeah. But when you're having your pet treated for heartworm disease, it's not the simple give them a couple of shots a month apart and you're set. Mm -hmm. This is a four to five month protocol that we're doing now. It's very important that the animals be kept very inactive. Yeah. In fact, some friends of mine, their um, son and uh, daughter-in-law were in town visiting and they had just adopted a dog with heartworm disease. Mm -hmm. And the veterinarians or the shelter down in Alabama told them, oh, we're gonna do the slow kill. And that just drives me crazy. Yeah. Because slow kill basically is not slow kill for heartworm, slow kill for the dog. Yeah. And it's starting to have symptoms because they were told the dog could run around and things. So we had the dog stop. We put him on some prednisone and started the antibiotics. And it's doing much better. So hopefully they'll follow up with the treatment down there. That's good. But if you are unfortunate enough to have your dog diagnosed with heartworm disease, the protocol has been developed by the American Heartworm Association after years of research, and it's very important you follow those protocols. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to kind of emphasize that. And so if you do have a pet with heartworm disease and you say, well, why aren't you treating my dog right now? This is why. Yeah. It is important, though, while they're being under the whole treatment that they still continue their preventative. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, let's move on to the tech tips. Yep. And tech tips this week, I wanted to talk a little bit about how to pick the right breed of dog for your family. Yes. A lot of people maybe gotten pets for Christmas or they said we're going to go to the pet store and pick out a puppy. Mm -hmm. So what are some resources people have to help them determine what breeds are really good and what kind of breeds should they be looking at for different situations? Well, uh, there are a lot of um, breed testing websites online nice. where you can literally just Google what dog is good for me. And they'll have you put in like some of your lifestyle in there. And they'll ask you, are you active? How often do you walk? How many people are in your house? Go ahead. Um, how many people are in your house? Or, you know, are you a couch potato? Things like this. And we want you to answer Honestly, because then that'll kind of help you decide what dog it is, you know, what living situation. If you live in right. an apartment, you don't want to get a horse-sized dog because, you know, you got to think they need room to run. They need room to play. You know, being stuck in a one-bedroom apartment is not good for most of these dogs. Um, we have a lot of hyper breeds like the uh, collies, not collies, uh, border collies, yeah. uh shepherds or you know um setters, greyhounds things like this that are made to be out there to run and made to work but you know people who have apartments you know just get them and they're in the house and so we get them and they're kind of you know they're not very well trained not very well socialized right. um you know they're not very well stimulated um but a lot of times it's just because they didn't pick the right breed for them um, if you're in an apartment, you know, maybe you want to go for a smaller dog. Um, right. And then you also have to think, too, what 
are good dogs for apartment life, not ones that sit up all night barking. Your beagles, uh, yeah. exactly. No beagles, or you know, you, you want to you or... want to be careful with things like chihuahuas or things like that that yeah. bark for smaller noises. Um, so a lot of times we see people who want smaller, quieter dogs. We see a lot of Shih Tzus. Yeah. And those are fine. Um, you know, they're smaller. They're good around families. Um, they're great for because they're quiet. And a lot of times you only ever really hear them bark if something actually is happening. Now, um, the other thing to consider, they do require a lot of grooming. They do. They do require a lot of grooming. So if you get, a, you know, again, certain dogs, you have to look into your living situation. So you have to afford to be able to get them groomed, right. you know, every four to six weeks or six to eight weeks, depending on which type of dog you have. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you can't upkeep that grooming, you know, something... You know, like maybe like a little Sheba yeah. would help. <laughs> um, less grooming. Right. Um, you know, they are a little talkative, but not crazy. Um, a but, little terrier or something. Yeah, like something that. a little terrier. Um, but you also, again, just this situation if you have a big house with lots of land, that's okay for you to get a bigger dog. Usually, in those situations, I wouldn't recommend people having smaller dogs because then you have birds of prey that can come down. Right. If you have a lot of land and you just let your dog outside, you're just you know, making it easy for a bird of prey to come out and say, oh, there's lunch for today. At that time, you yeah. want something and a little bigger. And fur just picks up all the birds mm-hmm. and all the debris and everything else. Yep, so you just want something a little more hyper, more oh, uh, bigger. Um, and then, you know, just dogs for family people. Like, a lot of people will get dogs and not think about, you know, a child or something. So a lot of... Um, uh, what's the one big Turner and Hooch dog? <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, the the Mastiff? Yeah, the one yeah. Mastiff type dog. Um, Yes, those dogs are great for, you know, older people. But a lot of time when you have younger children who aren't, you know, really raised around animals yet and they don't know how to respect the pet boundaries, big dogs like that, if a little kid jumps on a dog or pulls the tail or does something that this dog does not agree on, that's asking for trouble. And a lot of times, unfortunately, this is why big dogs end in shelters because people have children or babies or family members bring their kids in and these kids, again, don't respect the boundaries and now they're on top of these big dogs and... You know, unfortunately, a big dog's bite is going to be a lot worse than the smaller ones, and this is something that happens. So you'd want to, you know, try to find a breed that's good with children. And, you know, any breed can be good with children. It's always about, you know, people socializing their pet, too. But there are a lot of breeds out there that are just, you know, more baby oriented. And that's where those online tools will help you narrow that down. Mm -hmm. So if you've got kids, they're going to show you ones that are good for kids. Yeah, good for kids. Yeah. And, and then, yeah. yeah, and your mixed breed dogs are always an option. You're mm-hmm. going to find those at the pound. If you want to really have your heart set on a purebred dog, there's a lot of rescue organizations that can help you if you yeah, don't want to pay for uh, a puppy. Well, and a lot of things bread. most people don't realize because uh, people are always like, I want a purebred dog. Most shelters have purebred animals. That's true. And most people don't think about it. You know, if you have people that go out to the pet store or around holiday season get a puppy or something and that family member is allergic now, now you have to think someone has this purebred shepherd or purebred poodle or something, Great Dane, and they don't realize the time, the money, the effort, um, you know, if anyone has allergies or anything. And so now you have this purebred 10, 12 week old puppy and where do they go? It goes to a shelter. And so, like, now you can go to a shelter and you say, I want a purebred standard poodle puppy. And a lot of times a shelter will have that. You'd be yeah. surprised by how many purebred puppies are in a shelter, especially, unfortunately, around this time of year. And there's um, some dogs that you're only going to be able to find at a breeder because mm-hmm. they are in high demand. Yeah. And, you know, you may end up having to pay a lot for that dog, but that's what you have your heart set on and that's what you've done your research on. Just do mm-hmm. the research before you spend a lot of money on a purebred dog. Well, and then don't go broke buying a purebred dog that you, you know, you still need to pay for med- uh, medications, right. treatments, and vaccines Research and their medical problems, uh-huh. too, because a lot of these guys end up having a lot of medical problems. Mm-hmm. People love bulldogs dogs for some reason but they have a lot of medical issues. a lot of medical issues and then do your research on the breeder too you want to make sure you're getting a high quality pet yeah for what you're paying for you don't want to get a pet that the breeder's been breeding hip dysplasia for all these years and now you're paying for that and here's the thing too breeders oh we guarantee our pets but 
Who's going to return a dog that's sick after mm-hmm. they're, they want you to, they're not going to pay for your medical care, they're just going to give you another exactly. puppy. Exactly, they're just going to get you another one. So look one. at what the actual guarantee is, because they're not guaranteeing that they're going to take make the dog whole again, they're just guaranteeing they'll get another you another one. puppy. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and so this just one of those things, you don't just look into your lifestyle yeah. mostly, and then see how the people in your life are doing. If you have someone that you don't know is allergic to pets, maybe, you know, talk to them first before Mm -hmm. you get a dog. Or if your heart is set on getting a dog, make sure you look into research of hypoallergenic dogs. Um, They are out there and they'll be less likely to end up in a shelter um, or going to return back to a store or a breeder or something like that. If you know everyone in a house is not allergic to them. (laughs) And then you've always got... um Ask people who have that dark breed Mm -hmm. what the problems they've had. Would they get another one? Mm -hmm. Talk to your veterinarian. Talk to your veterinarian technicians. Yeah. (laughs) We all have pets. We've all seen these pets come into the clinic. We have our experiences with them, so we can give you some idea of what Mm -hmm. we think is going on with them as well. All right. Well, that's it for this week then. Um, Thanks for listening to us. Next week, we're going to talk about the opposite of the hyperadrenocorticism, hypoadrenocorticism, also known as Addison's disease. So we got Cushing's disease on one side, Addison's on the other. other. Mm -hmm. So uh, we just want to wish everybody a happy new year. We miss a new year now when you're listening to this and hope everything's going well. And we'll see you next time. I'm Dr. Jim Hosek. Bye.